One of the hardest things to do in church, really any church, is get plugged in to a smaller group of people that love you and care for you and disciple you. That's why we spend so much of our time making sure you know all about the groups we have here at The Branch. And there are many of them. And you can go to the app and check all of them out. But if you're not yet connected in a group, your next step is to join our 11 week long discipleship experience designed specifically for people looking for community. And it's called Rooted. I grew up in a time and place where having a faith was great and encouraged, but talking about it publicly was not. So the idea of even in front of people that I knew and trusted, talking about that was a very big hurdle for me to get over. Signing up for something like Rooted was my first major victory. We were disconnected. We felt we were kind of on the fray and we were basically isolating ourselves and we needed to come back into the fold and I knew this was a way that was structured and organized. Uh, there were a bunch of young people in the group and I was like, well, what do I have to do with any of these people? I am single and have children that are older than the people in the group, but then by the end of the 10 weeks, we just all connected and we loved each other and I allowed them to love me and I also loved on them. After we, we've gone through this process, one of the biggest things was immediately we noticed that we became family. We became extremely close. We've seen uh, folks serve for the first time ever. Uh, we've seen genuine repentance. We've seen um, folks who've been dealing with loneliness and who've been in the fringes uh, be a part of a community for the first time. My group became my inner circle. Like These are my trusted advisors. And if I'm about to make a mistake or I'm worried about making a mistake or I'm facing a challenge or a decision, my small group friends would be the ones like, guys, I really need your prayer. I really need discernment and wisdom. And it's not fluff. Honestly, I feel like we discuss sin um, very little in a church environment. It's not something that people wanna bring out in the open. And in Rooted, we discussed it as a group. Everything's confidential, so you feel really, you're like you're in a safe space doing it. We discussed what it looks like, how to identify it, and how to battle it. That was life-changing for me. Some of the things I'd never really talked about with anyone, that's probably the turning point for me is when it really started to feel like a family because I'm, I'm a barrier kind of guy. I like to put walls up inside myself around the parts I don't like and try and just pretend they no longer exist. And they really kind of help start tearing those walls down and open it up and being like, the only way you're ever gonna get free of all this stuff is you gotta go through it, you gotta work through it, and you don't have to do it alone. Once you start getting vulnerable and addressing or identifying things like that in your life, it makes you wanna go deeper. You're fed during the experience and you are also feeding others and loving others, and that's what we're called to do. It's something that I felt that was really missing from my life, that, that challenge and that connectedness. Just coming to church on a Sunday is not going to solidify your walk entirely. And all of these programs that we have here at the branch, if you open yourself up and you allow yourself to let the Holy Spirit work in you, I have found that life's just not as hard. Take account of where you are right now with your walk um, with Jesus and, and figure out Am I content with this? Figure out what the Lord is calling you to do uh, for your personal discipleship and for your discipleship as lived out in community. And if the Lord is calling you to do that and engage, we believe Rooted is a really great next step. I loved Rooted. I would recommend it to anyone, everybody. I don't care if you've been a Christian for 50 years or 50 days. Rooted will enrich your life. It will change your life. You will learn things you did not know, and God will use those things for His glory and for your good. We are so excited for you to experience the benefits of discipleship and community and the life that you find there. So ask the Lord if He wants you to join Rooted this fall, and if He does, go to the app and register because it starts on September 8th.
So I'm glad you got a chance just to, again, have some exposure to another round of Rooted that we're going to be doing this fall. And uh, my hope and my prayer is that perhaps uh, if you haven't been through it yet, that aroused your spirit and your heart some uh, for this really environment, as it's been a really fruitful, fruitful place for many, many people in the life of our church. And so I do pray that you're praying about that as uh, we're in the midst of ramping up for the fall and being a part of Rooted. So I heard about a church in West Texas that had a surprise guest one Sunday morning. And it was none other than the devil himself. And he appeared in this plume of smoke in the front of the sanctuary, right in the middle of the service, And everyone started screaming and running for the exits, practically trampling each other in the process. Everyone knew who it was. And before you knew it, everyone was gone except for one uh, older gentleman sitting on the third row. He didn't budge. And this confused Satan a bit. So he walked right up to the old man and he said, don't you know who I am? Do you know who I am? The old man said one word, yep. Well, aren't you afraid of me? Nope. Well, this totally perturbed Satan. And he angrily asked, why aren't you afraid of me? I've been married to your sister for 48 years. (laughs) I think most every person who's ever lived has someone they vilified at one point of their life or another. And if there was ever a villain in the earliest stages of the church, it would have to be a man named Saul, who today you know as Paul. And so if you're with us for the very first time, uh, you are catching us in the home stretch as a church. We have been on a particular reading plan uh, through scripture called the story reading plan that gives people a chance to read through about 80 to 85% of the Bible in order from Genesis to Revelation. And uh, we're on this reading plan. You can find it online, in fact. And this past week, we've been in uh, week 29 of this reading plan, which basically has us in the story of the Apostle Paul. It's entitled, Paul and His Mission, is what this last week's readings has all been about. And what, if you've been reading, you've been reading excerpts, again, from the book of Acts, which tells the story of Paul's mission to spread the message of Jesus throughout the Middle East and even into Europe. And what would happen is, is the Apostle Paul, as he would visit places like Philippi or Ephesus or Galatia, uh, people would come to faith in Christ, and those new believers who came to faith began to form churches. And after a a season of raising up leadership in those churches, Paul would then go to other places to spread the message. But that wouldn't be the last time these churches would hear from him. Uh, In future years, when he'd catch wind of problems that the churches were facing or challenges, he would sit down and write letters to them to try to provide some kind of insight, some kind of encouragement, maybe a little bit of correction. And some of these letters are found after the book of Acts and make up much of our New Testament. In fact, hopefully you'll, this is just a table of contents, for instance, from from a New Testament in many respects. And you have highlighted, that's Acts, which tells the story in many ways of the early church. But then these letters, Romans through really Philemon, some might wander into Hebrews too, but Romans through Philemon are basically Paul circling back around and writing letters to these churches after they have arisen except for Philemon, who's one individual, and he is, he is visiting with them about what it means to live as disciples in their particular context with the challenges they're facing. So I'm just explaining this for a lot of new believers or people who may not be familiar with the Bible. That's some of how the New Testament works in many respects. Let me say a, a second, uh, just, a, 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 just, a, just a couple things about why these letters are important. These letters are important because they address things that believers still struggle with today. And so what Paul wrote then has been a gift that is kept on giving for 2,000 years, amen? And so today you know Paul as the one who wrote about half of our New Testament. About 13 of the 27 books that make up your New Testament to be exact. Now, 
Today, right now, we're not going to dwell as much on his letters as I, I want to draw upon his life and the story of the man behind the mission. Because he's considered to be a giant of the Christian faith. So much so that Paul, before he encountered Jesus, his life and what it was like tends to be underappreciated because people are so aware of the impact of his life after he met Jesus. Before he became a hero in the Christian faith, he was a villain who went by another name, Saul. And you first meet him in Acts chapter 7 where he's present and he's approving the stoning to death of a key Christian leader named Stephen. And on that day, a great persecution broke out against the whole church in Jerusalem, against the followers of Christ, and Saul was complicit. Saul was leading the way. He didn't buy into Jesus. He thought Jesus was a false Messiah. He thought all the followers of Jesus were deceived. You see him again in Acts chapter 9, this time on the road to a city called Damascus. And Luke, who's writing Acts, says he's breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. And for a time in the book of Acts, you see Saul as the chief opponent and persecutor of anyone having anything to do with Jesus. He didn't believe Jesus had been resurrected, quite obviously, and he didn't believe he was divine. He didn't believe he was the Son of God. If anything, he thought Jesus' followers were a huge diversion that called people away from the one true God. But Most of you know, if you read last week's readings, two weeks ago, that Saul was literally blinded and blindsided by the light of the one he didn't believe in. He met Jesus on the road to Damascus. Now, it was the Beatle John Lennon who famously said, life is what happens to you when you're making other plans. We know Jesus is the life, and Jesus is what happens to you when you're making other plans. That's what Saul found out. He met Jesus on that road, and he had a supernatural encounter with Jesus that was a complete game changer. And so instead of riding into Damascus on a search and seize mission for Jesus' followers, he arrives in Damascus having been seized by Jesus, blind, helpless, led by the hand. And the problem is none of Jesus' followers would believe it at first when they heard about it, even if Jesus himself had told them. And we know that to be true because Jesus attempted to tell one of his followers, Ananias, in Acts chapter 9, hey, let me tell you about Saul. And the Lord tells Ananias to engage with Saul who's had an encounter with the Lord. Ananias is at first reluctant. Ananias actually lectures Jesus on all the ways that Saul is harming the church. Don't you love, don't you know the Lord loves it when he gets lectured by his people? As though Jesus needs informing. But then Jesus says to Ananias, go. This man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and the people of Israel, Acts 9 and 15. And it's here you see for the very first time the mission of Saul who would become Paul. This dude who was a Jew among Jews would be sent out to the non-Jews, their kings first, and then his own people. So Ananias went, Saul's sight was restored, he was baptized, and thus his journey begins. Here's what I wanna do with you. I wanna stop and offer some reflections on the Apostle Paul's life, but in two categories. I wanna offer you two reflections from his life before he met Christ that you can glean from the text and two reflections that you can glean from his life after he met Christ. Here are the first two, and we'll refer to him as Saul in these first two. The life of Saul reminds us that it's possible to be absolutely sincere and sincerely wrong. Later in his life, Paul gives this incredible testimony in Acts 22. He said, hey, it was my zeal for God that I persecuted followers of Christ. He, he, as he put it to a group of Jewish relig- religious leaders in Acts 22, 3, he said, I was just as zealous for God as any of you are today. Interesting, he gives the Jewish leaders the benefit of the doubt. 
He says, I was just as zealous for God as any of you are today. He was zealous to honor God in everything he did. He thought that the right thing to do was to launch a crusade against the followers of Jesus of Nazareth before they deceived anyone else into believing Jesus was the Son of God and following his teachings. Paul's own life reminds you that it's possible to be absolutely sincere and sincerely wrong. And this is just worth noting, I think, because you and I live in a culture today where we think sincerity trumps pretty much anything else. That if we're sincere, that's all that matters. Every now and then, you might hear somebody say, it doesn't really matter what you believe so long as you're sincere. But just because somebody believes something with all their heart doesn't make it true, nor will it automatically make the world a better place or make a difference in their lives for the better. The 19 hijackers that flew planes into buildings on 9-11 believed with all of their heart that what they were doing was true, right, and honored God and would lead them into an eternal paradise. It's possible to be absolutely sincere and sincerely wrong. Why do I say that? I think it's important for us to be self-aware. One of the most difficult and humbling exercises you could ever do, but I'd recommend you doing it, is to sit down and think about, just see if you can fill out a list of 10 times in your life when you were sincere, but later you realized you were absolutely wrong. I'd encourage you to do that. It's a humbling thing. But it's good to look back on your life and go, you know what, I was absolutely sincere in that moment in what I believed, but it turned out I was sincerely wrong. That was part of Paul's testimony. By the way, this is why one of the most off commands repeated in scripture is don't be self-deceived. One of the most off repeated commands is why we need the word, we need the spirit, we need community with one another, amen? Here's a second thing you can glean from the life of Saul before he met Christ. It's possible to be religious and still miss Jesus. Not only was he sincere in seeking to honor God when he was persecuting Christians, he was deeply religious and educated about God. Look at what else he just says about his testimony, just from what you can read in the text. Uh, Acts 22 and 3. He says, I am a Jew. I studied under Gamaliel and was thoroughly trained in the law of our ancestors. Gamaliel was among the greatest of the scholars and rabbis in Paul's time. Another insight to Paul's religious background is found in Philippians 3, 4 through 6. He he says about his background, if someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharisee, he's an expert in it, as for zeal, I was persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless, Saul was steeped in religion, steeped in a religious heritage. But religion and a religious heritage that doesn't lead to Jesus and isn't centered on Jesus is one big adventure in missing the point. Which is why Paul goes on to say later in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 10, I want to know Christ. How do you know when you're on an adventure of missing the point in the midst of religion? Oftentimes you look for a couple things. You look for the problem of comparison and you also look for the problem of division. For instance, Paul in Philippians 3 when he says, in regard to the law, I was faultless, he wasn't really faultless because he would say that later. That he was a sinner too. He was just faultless compared to everyone else. Remember, he's saying, if anyone else has uh, confidence in the flesh, I have more. He was stacking a comparison with everyone else. Compared to everybody else, I'm faultless. But see, that's what happens right there. That when you're on an adventure and missing the point and you lose sight of Jesus, you wind up in comparison and you wind up just dividing. I think about the guy who was walking across a bridge one day and he saw a dude standing on the edge about to jump off. He ran over and said, stop, don't do it. The guy said, well, why shouldn't I? The guy said, well, there's so much to live for. Well, like what? Well, are you religious? Yes, says the fellow he's about to jump. Guy trying to save him says, me too. 
Are you Christian or are you Buddhist? Christian, me too. Are you Protestant or are you Catholic? Protestant, me too. Are you Episcopalian or Baptist? Baptist, me too. Are you Baptist Church of God or Baptist Church of the Lord? Baptist Church of God, me too. Are you original Baptist Church of God, Reformation of 1879? Are you Reformed Baptist Church of God, Reformation of 1915? The fella about to jump said, Reformed Baptist Church of God, Reformation of 1915. To which the other fella says, well then, die heretic and pushes him off. (laughs) And over time, throughout Christian history, there have been seasons where saints have pushed one another off the proverbial bridge. That they lost sight of Jesus in the midst of their religion. By the way, a lot of people poo-poo religion being a bad word. It's, there is such a thing as religion that is pure and faultless, James 1.27. We'll talk about that some other time. All that's about is an order, a structure, a way of operating to engage with God and love other people. But sometimes we still lose Jesus in the midst of it. One of the most common themes of, of Paul's letters is he's attempting to call followers of Jesus back to a focus on Christ because they've gotten sidetracked by all sorts of religious minutia and rituals and have begun to make mountains out of molehills. And religion and religious heritages and religious rituals that aren't centered on Jesus or that drift from Jesus, and we're all prone to drifting, is one big, huge, disappointing adventure in missing the boat. So that's just two reflections from Saul's life about you can be religious and miss Jesus. We can be absolutely sincere and sincerely wrong. But let's talk about just two reflections from the life of Paul after he met Jesus. The first is this, when it comes to having a relationship with Jesus, no one is hopeless. That's one of the things his life will tell you. When Paul becomes a follower of Jesus, almost, uh, there were were believers that just had trouble believing it. They couldn't help but think of him in light of his past. They thought he was hopeless. There's this epic story in Acts chapter nine where Saul becomes this new follower of Christ But he's on the run because the Jewish religious leaders that he used to work with are now angry that he switched sides, that he's changed jerseys, and they've hatched a plan to kill him. The Jerusalem church won't let him in the door. They won't help him because they don't believe he's really changed. And it takes a, a dude named Barnabas who stands up and becomes an advocate on Paul's behalf and convinces the church to begin to change its mind and begin to receive Paul. What Barnabas did probably saved Paul's life toward the end of Acts chapter nine. Barnabas saw more in Paul than his past. No one is hopeless when it comes to having a relationship with Jesus. No matter how bad their start is in life without him, how long they go in life without him, and while Jesus is well aware of our past, he's far more interested in our future because he died for our past that we might have a future. And I'm not just talking about a future beyond the grave. I'm talking about a future before the grave so you can live while you're alive, a future on this side of the grave. I'm talking about the possibility of change. A change so real and so significant that you could very well put in for a name change, which is what happened with Saul, who became Paul. No wonder Paul said later, he knew it in 2 Corinthians 5 and 17, he said, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone, the new is here, all this is from God. Man, I'm talking about this right now, and I can't help but think of Wendell Stanley He's with Chris Geigel here in this picture. He's one of our brothers in Christ among us at the Farmer's Branch campus. We got connected with Wendell through Sober Living America that we've been building a connection with. And for a while to get to church, Wendell would take an Uber to a bus stop and take a bus stop to the nearest then bus stop, closest to our Farmer's Branch campus, and then walk to the Farmer's Branch campus. And he started to bring visitors with him that way, who didn't have a car. One of them was a man named Charles Willis, who we had the privilege of seeing baptized into Christ a few months ago. Well, Chris, in the picture, was curious about why Wendell would take an Uber 
And, and he knew, obviously, you're taking an Uber because he didn't have access to transportation. Why he would take an Uber, then a bus, then walk to church. Why all the effort to do that when you're driving by maybe a hundred other churches. And Wendell just said that for the first time in 60 years, he felt so warmly embraced by people here with not even a hint of prejudice toward him because of his race, his addiction, or his time in prison. He hadn't found it yet until he walked into the Farmer's Branch campus. And he said, I can't tell you what it's like, or he said, I, it, the experience of walking in there time and time again and worshiping, and nobody was clutching their purse when they saw me. He said, I'd known of God all my life, but now for the first time, I have a relationship with him. So there's a couple in our church who've been touched by Wendell's testimony, they came forward and offered to buy Wendell a used vehicle. Wendell wept. Wendell asked Chris to help him step out and with those funds find an appropriate used vehicle. So Chris and Wendell went car shopping. While they're in the course of car shopping, Chris asked Wendell about his family that he was estranged from. And Wendell said, I've had no relationship with them for many years, and deservedly so. Wendell felt fully responsible for the state of the relationship, for what he had done earlier in his life as a husband and as a father. And Chris said, well, our God is a God of reconciliation. And so we will pray for that. And right there while used car shopping that day, Chris prayed for the miracle of reconciliation. So the next day, Wendell thought he'd take a step of faith. He reached out to his ex-wife, and for the first time in a long time, she responded favorably. And in the course of the conversation, he went on to ask if he could have his adult son's phone number. And surprisingly, she said yes. He messaged his son. Not only did his son respond, but in the course of conversing, he said, Dad, I'd like to take you out for Father's Day. And on that day, when Wendell's son took him out for Father's Day, Wendell's son brought his own little boy. And Wendell got to meet his grandson. And there are three generations of Stanleys ate lunch together for a Father's Day. That was immeasurably more than anything Wendell could have ever asked or imagined. He thought the family tree was sunk. They've talked or texted every day since. There is no one hopeless when it comes to Jesus. And he is so often in the business of returning with the locust have eaten up. Whether you're talking about the story of Paul's transformation or the story of Wendell's transformation. No one is hopeless. But we also learn something else from the Apostle Paul that when it comes to a relationship with Jesus and being in a relationship with Jesus, nothing is useless. Paul's a great illustration of this. For example, Paul was from Tarsus. You say, what's the big deal about Tarsus? Tarsus was a key city in the Roman Empire. What some say had the most advanced university system in the Roman Empire. Paul, at some point in his earliest years, grew up around the finest education imaginable. It was going to serve him well later in life when he finds himself dialoguing with the intellectual Greeks and philosophers in places like Athens in Acts chapter 17, as well as city leaders and governmental leaders in the Roman Empire. And yet, because he was born in Tarsus, he was a Roman citizen. That would serve him well, because on certain occasions in Acts, people wanted to put Paul to death. And in all 
and, and in these particular situations of all things, it was Rome that stepped in and protected him because he had rights as a Roman citizen. What's even more interesting is that Paul knew of his rights as a Roman citizen and would exercise them on occasion for the stake of staying alive and free as long as he could to advance the gospel in the Roman Empire. Now think about this. Paul studied under Gamaliel, as I already said, the greatest scholar in the old, of the Old Testament in his day. This enabled him to relate to the Jews when it came to his message about Christ. You say, Chris, what are you saying? I'm saying this. All of his experiences, all of his education, all of his background enabled Paul to do what he would talk about in places like 1 Corinthians 9, 19 and 23, when, when Paul said this, that though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. Stop right here. It's not that Paul was trying to be somebody that he wasn't. He's a Jew. But what he's saying is, to the Jews, he tapped into his Jewishness to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I'm not free from God's law, but I'm under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. Stop right there. What's he saying? He's talking about the Gentile world. He understands the Gentile world, people that didn't know the Jewish law, because he was born and raised in Tarsus. To the weak, I became weak to win the weak. And if you know anything about Paul, he was weak physiologically, had a difficult life. I have become all things to all people so that by all possible means I might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel. The point is nothing in Paul's life before he encountered Jesus was wasted. It was used unto the purposes of Jesus in the end. I've told you before, God is the great recycler. He doesn't waste anything, man. God was green before this world ever was, you know. That he's in this business as a redeemer in so many ways. And this isn't just true when it comes to your experiences and upbringing and background. It's even true when it comes to the things in your past that are wrong, that are sinful, that you're ashamed of. Paul would say later in 1 Timothy 1, 15 and 16, here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. In other words, Paul says, I was the worst of sinners, but one of the ways, one of the reasons he saved me is to use my life as a display case for how patient Jesus is. Some of you might be particularly convicted about the jerk you've been in your life. I got good news for you. That can be a display case for how patient God is with you. And the truth is, all of us know what it is to feel as Fod feel, as Paul feels, because the longer you spend time in the light, the more aware you become of your own darkness and the more aware you become of his immense patience and radical grace that saved you all along. Paul's acknowledging that even the darkness in his life could be used as a testimony to help people realize that if Jesus is willing to save and use somebody like him, he's willing to save and could use somebody like anyone. I just remind you, since we've been reading through Scripture this year in our readings, how many significant people in Scripture have chapters of darkness in their own life? Whether you're talking about Moses as a murderer or Jacob as a liar or David as an adulterer, a liar and a murderer, or Peter a denier of Jesus, I could go on and on. Most every hero in Scripture has dark chapters in their life, and it's the dark chapters of your story that remind you you that if God can bring magnificent endings out of these dark chapters, then he can bring one out of yours. He can bring one out of mine. Paul will just remind you of the old saying that every saint has a past. Every saint has a past. Every sinner has a future. And nothing is useless when it's carried into relationship with Jesus. Nothing is. Every one of us brings experiences and skills and regrets and darkness to the table of our relationship with Jesus, and he can use all of those things to serve his purposes in our world so long as you just come to the table. 
Some time ago, a woman named Josefina Guerrero from Manila in the Philippines was awarded the Medal of Freedom by the U.S. She had saved an untold number of lives toward the end of World War II. When the Japanese invaded the Philippines, she actually volunteered to help the American effort against the Japanese. She was a woman of high society, had some influence. The Japanese actually wanted her to serve with them. She refused. The Japanese didn't want to harm her. They kept trying to convince her to work with them. She went to work for America, of all things, as a spy. On one of her first missions, she mapped out the waterfront fortifications of the Japanese and the location of the anti-aircraft guns, and she sketched what she saw with nothing more than a sketchbook and a pencil, and with her drawings, American planes were able to pinpoint their targets. She actually had a trade name in espionage. She was referred to as Joey. And for three years, she fulfilled numerous assignments with one mission, taking her through 56 miles of encampments and checkpoints and minefields on foot with a top secret map she was forming taped to her back. The war ended and her job ended. Years went by before her story got out and was validated and eventually the United States government brought her to Washington, D.C. and awarded her the Medal of Freedom. The peculiar thing about Josefina Guerrero is that uh, she was stopped many times by suspicious Japanese, but she was never searched and never apprehended in three years of espionage. They wouldn't spend much time with her because she had a secret weapon. She had a weakness that turned out to really be a strength for what it is she was doing. It was a deterrent to anybody who would ever think about detaining her and searching her because Josephina had leprosy. And because she had leprosy, the Japanese really didn't want to get all that close to her. And her primary weakness worked to her advantage and really to America's advantage. I love that story. I love that story because it just reminds you of how even a weakness can serve a purpose in the end. And when it comes to your relationship with Jesus, he can use what you are, what you have, where you've been, for better or for worse, for his purposes. Josephina had a mission. Paul had a mission. You and I do too. No one out here is hopeless. And nothing in your life is useless. And the story is still unfolding. It was Mother Teresa who said, I'm just a pencil in the hands of God. So put yourself in his hands. Because there are still chapters waiting to be written. Just ask Wendell. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads with me. I want you to take a moment and consider what is it that the Spirit of God is saying to you right now? What does He want? What has He brought to mind as I've been before you? Is there a situation that you feel pretty hopeless? Usually, underneath hopelessness is at least one lie. Ask God to help you see the truth about that situation. Even if it's a hard truth that invites you to have a change of perspective or a change in action, a change in attitude, ask him to help you see the situation with his eyes. Maybe others of you are thinking about wasted years and bad decisions. And go ahead and just take a moment and ask the Lord to use this for his purposes even if you can't see how ask him to use it for his purposes
some of you feel limited right now. I would remind you that Paul wrote just about all of his letters while in prison in a very limited context. And yet what he did in chains and behind bars is the thing that has reached the world the most from his life and ministry. What he did when his life was radically limited. And in the places where you feel limited, may God fill that place with perspective and his power. Lord, I thank you for your presence right now. I bless your name. We thank you for the life of Paul and we thank you for our life. That you're in the business, Lord. You're in the business of redemption and hope. You're in the business of using what we think is unusual. You are in the business of redeeming what we think is irredeemable. And we bless your name and ask us to use us accordingly this week through Christ. Won't you be standing? Won't you just worship with me?